For many of you, uh, or for many others, perhaps not for any of you, I would suppose, the phrase urban wildlife may mean uh, where the hot singles bar is in town. Uh, that is not what our program is all about today. For some of us, urban wildlife means the birds that we feed in our feeders, perhaps the deer that visit our backyards or neighborhood, raccoon and other species that uh, are part of our life. What is not thought of very often is how do you protect that urban wildlife? Can in fact an urban situation and wildlife coexist? And are there opportunities not only to have wildlife coexist in our urban settings, but to take advantage of it uh, as a, a people, to share it with our children and with each other? We have been fortunate here in Portland to have had a long uh, and fabled history, beginning with the Olmsted brothers, that focused on open spaces, parks, and other areas. But wildlife has never been a major focus uh, when we've talked about parks in the past. Our speaker today is making a difference in the urban wildlife area. Mike Houck is working to not only preserve those open spaces, but to enhance urban wildlife through the development of a metropolitan wildlife refuge system. Mike uh, has a bachelor's degree from Iowa State in uh, zoology and also has a master's degree from Portland State in teaching in biology. He has been inventorying wildlife habitat in the metropolitan area for the Audubon Society of Portland since 1982, and since January of this year has become director of the Metropolitan Wildlife Refuge System Project for the Audubon Society. Will you help me welcome a very special vision, protecting our wild, urban wild lands, a renewed vision. Here's Mike Houck. Thank you for that uh, kind welcome. I would also like to thank Paul Ketchum, um, Clark Worth, and others on the Land Use and Transportation Committee for arranging me to be here today. I would like to point out, for those of you who didn't see them on the way in, there are some handouts on the table that you're, you're welcome to take. They're free of charge, and they cover some of the topics that I'll be talking about today. Um, one of those, I think one of the most important ones, actually, is a bibliography that I produced that has a listing of all the references that I looked through in, in, in preparing for today's talk. And I think that will be very important for those of you who want to go back and do some of, of your own research on some of the history. And the title is Protecting Our Urban Wildlands, Renewing a Vision. I must admit to being, well, more than somewhat nervous, I'm very nervous about speaking today. I'm thinking about following C. Everett Koop. Last night, we have John McPhee. Tonight, Stephen J. Gould. And those are people next week, Matthew Prophet, and today is Friday the 13th. <laughs> Putting all that together uh, <clears throat> made me a, a bit nervous. I am very pleased and not, to be quite honest, terribly surprised to see a very good turnout today. Um, certainly not for the speaker, but I think for the topic. As the title implies, my talk relates to natural areas within our urban environment, an issue that has drawn intense public interest throughout the United States and internationally. Those of you who were fortunate enough to attend last February's talk delivered by Dr. David Good, who's director of the London Ecology Unit, got a very good glimpse, I think, of the Greening of the Cities movement throughout the world. We have our own Greening of the Cities movement emerging in the Portland-Vancouver, or I should say re-emerging in the Portland-Vancouver area now that I'd like to focus on today. I will discuss historical efforts to address this issue, review what progress we've made, and finish with uh, some modest recommendations. If you're wondering, wondering what I mean by wild lands, most of those who know me um, know that I usually talk about wildlife habitat. I've been berated recently by a landscape architect who has said uh, that to him, uh, the term wildlife habitat is too narrow and that I should use wild lands. So for today, Dean Apostle, if you're listening out there somewhere, I'm using wild lands. We need to cultivate a renew or renew our understanding, our feeling for the landscape, which some describe as a sense of place. What does living here mean to us on an intuitive gut level? To integrate our favorite stream corridors, volcanic buttes, 
the Tualatin Mountains, and our scenic river systems, the Sandy, Willamette, Tualatin, and Columbia, into our everyday lives, our sense of place. Urban wildlands, to me, are those areas that have retained their naturalness, understanding, of course, there are virtually no areas which have remained untouched by human impacts. Wildlands include wetlands, riparian corridors, and forests. They range in size, as was pointed out earlier, from our backyards to, to areas like 5,000 acre forest park. They are private lands, park lands, and even some corporate parks. I'm personally today not including farmland, although Tony Hiss makes an eloquent argument to do so in his excellent New Yorker articles Encountering the Countryside, August 21st and 28th of this year. And I'd recommend any of you who are concerned about the, the farmlands at the urban farm inter rural interface to definitely read those articles. I talked to, Doc, uh, to Tony Hiss, by the way, and he's very interested in coming here next spring for our, our third annual Country in the City Symposium. Nine years ago, as was mentioned, I began wildlife habitat inventories in the Portland area. I was told by one county planner at that time that state land use laws protecting wildlife habitat and wetlands do not apply in the cities. Recently, I've heard it argued that we should fully develop our cities and that protection of urban natural areas is a luxury we cannot afford. Well, we all know now that land use laws do apply in the city, and there are, in fact, many professional planners, landscape architects, political leaders, and certainly citizens who not only expect but demand that natural resources be protected in our cities. The number of citizens who support that effort are growing, not shrinking, and I would suggest that any planner or politician who doesn't realize that is out of touch with their constituencies. The first thing I said I'd do today is present a historical backdrop. Concern over urban parks and natural areas is certainly not new. Locally, the Olmsted brothers, Lewis Mumford, and more recently, Craig, the Columbia Region Association of Governments, which was Metro's predecessor, have all presented impassioned and visionary schemes for managing the urban outdoors. If I do nothing else today, I would, I would hope to establish the fact that we have a, a well-documented legacy of park, landscape, and land use planning that provides us an invaluable resource for us to draw on. The Olmsteads, in their 1903 report to the Portland Park Board, stated, while there are many things which contribute to the beauty of a great city, unquestionably one of the greatest is a comprehensive park system. Their park system included rural parks and scenic reservations, which had the following qualities. Areas that afford the quiet contemplation of natural scenery, the rougher, wilder, and less artificially improved parks. I'm sure that Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services that I see out in full force today, Washington County, and the Unified Sewerage Agency would agree that one of the Olmstead's most far-sighted recommendations regarded treatment of stream corridors. They stated, enormous advantage, advantages are gained by locating parks and parkways so as to take advantage of beautiful natural scenery. Marked economy may also be affected by laying out parks while land is cheap, so as to embrace streams that carry at times more water than can be taken care of by drain pipes. Thus, brooks or little rivers, which would otherwise be put in large underground conduits at great public expense, may be made attractive parkways. There's a movement throughout the United States today to do exactly that. In addition to a comprehensive park system, the Olmsteads urged the city to provide connections between parks, maintaining that a connected park system was manifestly far more complete and useful than a series of isolated parks. We've been very fortunate in the Portland area to have an active group, the 40 Mile Land Use Trust, take that recommendation and run with it, and they've done an excellent job of, of trying to connect our parks through the 40 Mile Loop, which has actually grown to be uh, roughly 140 miles today. Well, 45 years later, in July of 1938, interestingly, in this room, Lewis Mumford made an impassioned plea for regional planning that would embrace both sides of the Columbia River. He advocated at that time a bi-state effort that would overcome the artificial political boundary set in the middle of the Columbia River. Mumford minced no words in this recommendation for regional planning for the Columbia Gorge and the Portland metropolitan area. He said, people who pay attention to abstract figures 
pay more attention to abstract figures than realities are accustomed to look upon a river as a dividing line. Rivers are dividing lines from only one point of view, and that's military attack. From every other point of view, the river as a whole is a unit, and he recommended that we manage the river in that manner. In June 1971, Craig, the CRAG, the Columbia Region Association of Governments, building on these earlier recommendations, presented a comprehensive scheme for regional open space planning. How many people have read their report, just out of curiosity, in the room? A few. The Craig report, which was titled Proposals to the Portland-Vancouver Community for a Metropolitan Park and Open Space System, and it was a rather long title that may have something to do with how many people have read it. There it was actually a, a subtitle, The Urban Outdoors, which I prefer. Um, in the report, they stated in the preface, for many persons in the city, the presence of nature is the harmonizing thread in an environment otherwise of man's own making. The report went on to state, among other things, that comprehensive planning should identify floodplains, wetlands, scenic, wildlife, and recreational areas, and that development needed to be controlled. It also echoed Mumford's concerns about the lack of resolve to engage in bi-state cooperative efforts. The report stated prophetically, it is yet to be seen whether the Portland-Vancouver urban community in the states can muster the drive, inspiration, and the legal tools to develop a regional park and open space program. To me, the most significant accomplishment of the Craig Report was to do such an excellent job of integrating Olmsted's comprehensive and connected park system philosophy with Mumford's regional approach to produce a proposed urban outdoors program, which proposed to relieve the monotonous and mechanical by preserving and enhancing those environmental features that have already stamped the region with their unique form and character or sense of place, which makes it a very special place to live. The goals of Craig's recommendations were four. One, to conserve and preserve environmental values. Second, to preserve rivers, streams, creeks, ravines, high points, and historic sites. And uh, this, you have to remember this is in 71. I'm sure today they'd add wetlands, <clears throat> right? Third, to create a balanced system of neighborhood, community, and regional parks interconnected by a greenway system, which is certainly consistent with the Olmsted proposal. And lastly, to put the case, this is an important one, and the main reason I'm really glad to be here today, to put the case for regional parks and open space on an equal footing with freeways, utilities, and other public systems. With a few notable exceptions, we have accomplished relatively few of these recommendations set forth by the Olmsteads, Mumford, and, Craig, and the Craig Report. What became of all these recommendations? Well, I personally don't care all that much for baseball, but given that the World Series is upon us, I'm going to use an analogy. In my opinion, we're basically, the count is 0-2 in the bottom of the ninth with two out. We blew it with the Craig Report and didn't act on Mumford's proposals, at least as far as the Portland-Vancouver area is concerned. We have managed to pick up some of the lands recommended by the Olmsteads, but I'd count that as a foul tip at best, since most of that activity occurred in the 40s and 50s. Today, we're poised with a fat, blazing fastball coming right down the middle. We have a great opportunity to connect, but will we? That's really the reason I'm here today, to urge a renewed vision to accomplish what has so forcefully and passionately been advocated over the past 86 years, the formation of an integrated, and that's the key word, system of natural areas or wild lands for the Portland-Vancouver region. The time has arrived for us to decide whether all the political slogans and PR pieces are for real. Are we really committed to main maintenance of quality of life in the metropolitan region, or is it this merely jingoism? Does the fact that Oregon is open for business mean the store is for sale? Recent figures published in the Oregonian confirm that everyone in this room knows that development in the Portland-Vancouver area is booming, and so is population growth, which has leaped by 20% in Washington County and Clark County by 19% in the last three years. Few people think, I think, are aware of the implications projects like the proposed West Side Bypass holds for areas like Forest Park and Savvy Island, regional resources regarded by most people as sacrosanct. The bypass and other regional transportation projects 
coupled with intensifying urban development, pose major threats to the urban landscape or the urban fabric. On the water quality front, DDT, pesticide residues, and other toxic compounds are turning up in our waterways. Olmsted's fear that we might resort to putting streams in large culverts has indeed come to pass, and it has been at great public expense. And interestingly, in Bellevue, uh, Berkeley, and many other U.S. cities, they're going back and tearing streams out of the culverts, liberating them and restoring them in the urban centers. <clears throat> Fortunately, we have the opportunity to avoid those expenses over the long run if we act now in protecting the streams as they are, which will contribute to water quality as well. We're facing a crisis with respect to maintaining our sense of place, the identity that makes the metro area a special place to live. We're eroding away the very character of our land. I recently learned that the Chinese use two characters to depict crisis. The two opposing symbols denote danger on the one hand and opportunity on the other. We've already looked at some of the dangers and you know there are many others. I'd like now for the rest of the, my talk to focus on some exciting opportunities that give me hope that we will not miss that fastball. Why am I optimistic that we might finally manage to act on earlier recommendations and formulate our own vision for the future of the metropolitan area? Fortunately, new partnerships are evolving to address parks and open space, water quality and quantity, and wildlife habitat loss issues. Hiss, in his New Yorker article, refers to these new alliances as, quote, loosely knit public-private partnership of local government, college research programs, and nonprofit environmental groups like Audubon. I would add, however, in our particular case, two very important factors without which we won't get anywhere, in my opinion. One is a strong neighborhood association, which we know we have in the Portland area, and the second is the business community. I add business interests because at least the enlightened ones know they too have a stake in maintaining a quality of life that attracts highly skilled employees, which we heard about a little earlier, and executives to the Portland, Vancouver area. A look at many corporate ads these days reveals that an important recruitment tool is the natural environment. For example, a recent ad titled, Portland the Natural Choice, reads, we came here for all the right reasons. When we selected Portland, we knew it could be an emerging center for scientific research set in a backdrop of natural beauty. For us, the outdoor environment is every bit as important as the indoor workplace environment. There's also a growing sense of corporate environmental responsibility internationally and locally. A British publication I picked up last year titled in Industry Caring for the Environment states, there is an increasing awareness throughout industry that environmental protection is not an optional extra. It is a fundamental component to good industrial management. Locally, the coal company in Beaverton, the Port of Portland, and Portland General Electric Company are becoming involved in projects such as last year's Country in the City Symposium, and they were instrumental in, bring, in helping bring David Good um, from London. They're also, they've also become involved in putting together management plans for Smith and Bybee Lakes, Oaks Bottom, and providing other expertise for um, ecological problems in the Portland area. Well, we've obviously got a long ways to go in developing these partnerships, but it's obviously in everyone's interest to put a lot of energy into that effort. Given all this, are we seeing any successes in the cause of regional planning for parks and open space? Although there are a number of projects which all have the potential to contribute toward this goal, and some of those are the Tualatin River cleanup, the work that the Bureau of Environmental Services is doing on the Columbia Slough, and I think importantly, the, the proliferation of local neighborhood friends groups throughout the Portland, Vancouver area. There are two projects I would like to personally discuss because I know, I know them fairly well firsthand. One is uh, the Metropolitan Wildlife Refuge System. Thanks to a three-year challenge grant from Fred Meyer Charitable Trust, the first of its kind to my knowledge, we began at Portland Audubon Society last January a project to establish a Portland-Vancouver Metropolitan Wildlife Refuge System. The idea for this actually grew out of a meeting that I had with Barbara Walker, who's with the 40 Mile Loop Land Trust. When I first saw Barbara's slides, it was very obvious that the loop, which tends to follow natural features in the landscape, coincided with those areas that I've been looking at for the last nine years of tremendous uh, regional and local significance. 
It was a marriage of tremendous recreational and wildlife viewing opportunities too good to pass up. The concept to link these two efforts are also in keeping with the philosophies espoused by the Olmsteads, Mumford, and the 1971 Crag Report. Beyond that, which is very important to me, it's all, it also represents an opportunity to manage these as ecosystems rather than on a site-by-site -site basis, which is doomed to failure over the long haul. The Metropolitan Wildlife Refuge System, then, is a plan to promote the management of natural areas, primarily existing public lands and parks, as natural ecosystems and to educate the public through informational signs and brochures, some of which you've seen out front, and also to encourage appropriate uh, public recreation in these areas through mechanisms like the 40-mile loop. Well, I was uh, planning on showing some slides today, and I decided to opt out of that because when I get slides up there, I tend to ramble, and we've got a very short period of time. Um, so I'll apologize to anybody who was looking forward to slides. Uh, for now, a verbal tour will have to suffice. Um, I will point out, however, that I, I'm renting a bus for Saturday, October 1st, and any of you who are interested, and I'll rent two or three if I need to, um, in uh, coming on a tour to get a first-hand view, and that's really where I prefer to do it, is out there in the field, on the ground. I would like to invite City Club members to uh, participate in that. Saturday, December 1st. <laughs> Did I say October? Okay. Told you I was nervous. For now, let's take a quick imaginary look at a few representative sites in the system. And I'd like to start with Savi Island. And I'd be curious, how many of you have ever been out there on a winter morning at sunrise, pretty early? <laughs> Quite a few. Watching bald eagles flying onto the island from the west. I know there are some people in the room who have done that. Well, there's no way to describe to you, really, even if I had a slide, the incredible impact that that has standing watching 30 bald eagles flying from their old growth forest roost to the west onto the island every morning, half hour before sunrise to about 45 minutes after sunrise, um, onto the island to feed. And all the while, as you're watching eagles maybe 50 feet over your head, there's a flock of four to 500 sandhill cranes behind you and countless waterfowl, all framed by Mount Hood with the sun coming up to the east. Tremendous. Um, experience. And in fact, we'll be doing some field trips through Audubon again this year doing a bald eagle watch, and I'd, I'd encourage you all to come. Well, just across the Columbia River, that natural dividing line is the Vancouver Lake Lowlands. I know there's some folks here from Clark County today. There are more than 300 heron nests around Vancouver Lake, thousands of wintering waterfowl, and a tremendous recreational system planned for the Salmon River Greenway. Just to the east, the Sandy River Gorge, a National Scenic Waterway, where this weekend, if you're not on Saturday at 11.45, if you're not watching Coop or watching baseball, the sixth annual Salmon Festival, something that started out with 40 or 50 people walking up the Sandy River six years ago, Charlie Seco from Oloma County Parks, Bill Bakke from Oregon Trout, um, to watch salmon, Chinook salmon, returning to the Sandy River in Oxbow County Park. Well, I don't know if you've ever watched somebody for the first time see a salmon actually spawning. There is no way, again, to describe that. How many people have been out there? How many people have never seen salmon spawning, just out of curiosity? Okay, quite a few people in the room. Well, that festival has grown from 40 or 50 people six years ago to last year over 3,400 people came over that weekend, about 2,000 of whom walked up the river to take a look at this incredible natural phenomenon. For those of you who've grown tired of the rhetoric regarding the old growth issue, you can walk at Oxbow County Park through ancient Douglas fir hemlock forests and discover for yourself what the mature forest ecosystem is all about. The Nature Conservancy's Dyack track on the Sandy is the closest thing to a lush temperate rainforest I've seen south of the Olympics. The ash and cottonwoods are festooned with lichens and bryophytes. And this time of year, you'll hear the eerie call of a very thrush off in the background. And I noticed Arch and Fran were here today. I'm pleased to see them. And I think Portland is indebted to them for helping protect the Sandy River Gorge. Back in Portland on the Willamette River is Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. That's how I got involved in Audubon about 15, 16, who knows how many years ago. It's now the, fir the first officially designated wildlife refuge in the Portland Park System. It contains over 160 acres of wetlands, riparian and forest habitat, and supports over 140 species of birds, all of this within view of the Coin Tower in downtown Portland. 
I think I'll uh, dispense with the rest of the sites I was going to cover and just mention that there, there really are too many too, there really are too many to go into detail today. Jackson Bottoms Wildlife Area in Hillsboro, Tualatin Hills Nature Park, Hedges Creek Marsh, Elk Rock Island, Pal Butte, and Kamasi Nature Conservancy in West Lynn. This will be the most exciting system of urban natural areas in any North American city. There really is nothing like it in the country, and such a system would be the focus for management of many of our most significant parks and open spaces as well as providing a marketing tool for the Portland, Vancouver Visitor Bureaus and Convention Center. And I really don't think it's possible to overstate the importance of having these sorts of ref, uh, resources in a major metropolitan area and that we can market them effectively and they will attract visitors to Portland. Well, the system. I have to emphasize that this system is not a done deal. We have a lot of work ahead of us. The system will become a reality only when there is cooperation among park districts, when local jurisdictions protect critical wildlife corridors and wetlands, and when we have a strategy for acquisition for future, of future lands. The next project, the second project today I'd like to mention, will play a major role in achieving many of those objectives. The seeds for this program were sown about five years ago, and Ned Look can correct me on this, at the Columbia Willamette Futures Forum. What evolved at the forum as a vision for a regional park and natural areas program has finally germinated and is blossoming as a Metropolitan Service District's regional park and natural areas study. This program represents a renewed attempt to identify the remaining natural areas in the Portland-Vancouver metropolitan environment. The reason this effort is so exciting is that it has grown out of a desire by local park planners, local planners, citizens, and elected officials to address problems I've already alluded to today. Metro has been a tremendous facilitator in this, in this effort, and a lot of credit has to be given to Mel Huey and, and uh, Pat Lee and others who have really pushed that project, because it started out with a lot of uh, skepticism, I think, on the part of local jurisdictions, afraid that Metro was going to try to come in and, and take over their turf. And, Fortunately, happily, and I think it's, it's due to Metro staff, that um, attitude has really been averted, and, we've, we're, and we're on the move on a tremendously exciting project. One example of the cooperative nature of Metro's project is the acquisition of new color infrared aerial photography, which will allow us to look at natural areas at a scale as large as one inch to 125 feet. And for any of the, uh, those of you who are um, familiar with the problems associated with doing these kinds of inventories. That's a tremendous tool. There's an example of that photography in the back. I see Paul Ketchum back there standing next to it. This incredible planning tool will be used by Dr. Joseph Porosky of, of PSU's geography department to conduct an inventory of all natural areas within Metro's boundaries and in some instances outside the current Metro boundaries in anticipation of future park needs. This demonstrates what can be achieved when you get a diverse group of people together. And I'm telling you, this group you would not have projected a year ago we would have ever gotten together. You've got the Corps of Engineers, you've got Audubon Society, you've got all four metro counties, you've got neighborhood groups, um, you've got a tremendous diversity of about 40 cooperators at this point, I'm pretty sure. This, of course, is only the first step in what will be a lengthy process of identification of priority lands for acquisition, and many of us hope will provide the framework for a regional parks and natural area system. And I would like to point out again that I can't again, overemphasize the importance of having received funding from the Fred Meyer Charitable Trust for this project, because Metro at the, at the time was unable to act quickly enough to get the flight done, flown last May. Well, it so happened that because of having that grant money and being a cooperator, forming a partnership with Metro, we were able to put the money up front and then get all of those 40 uh, cooperating agencies and organizations to participate. And it's resulted in a lower cost for everybody who's participating. Well, with these two complementary programs, the Metropolitan Wildlife Refuge System and Metro's Regional Natural Areas Inventory in high gear, I'd like to share some closing suggestions that I hope will ensure all of these efforts don't gather dust as the Craig study did. First, Metro being the only agency with regional authority must maintain a strong presence in parks and natural areas planning. It's clear to everyone in everyone's mind that Metro's ability to be a facilitator 
in this arena is essential to dealing with natural resources that cut across jurisdictional boundaries. On the other side of the Columbia, the Intergovernmental Resource Center has a similar role to play, and I'm hopeful that Metro and IRC can, can cooperate in this effort, although Metro obviously has the lead role. Second, we must move toward a regional natural area system. The manner in which we accomplish this task is open to debate. One of the models that I've been pushing is the East Bay Regional Park District in the Bay Area. In fact, Commissioner Lindbergh, um, Commissioners Anderson and McCoy from Oldham County, and John Mignano from Clark County, Richard Devlin, and Jim Gardner, our counselors for Metro, and a group of us are going down next week to take a look at how the district was put together 50 years ago. They now have 60,000 acres of natural areas. They acquired, or they just passed, a $225 million bond measure in Contra Costa and Alameda counties, which is their jurisdiction, for acquisition of another 30,000 acres over the next five years. They're looking at where the growth is going, and they're going after that land, as the Olmstead suggested, before it gets too expensive, and we need to be moving in that direction. Third, we need to complete the 40-mile loop and expand its concept to produce a regional trails program. The concept of an interconnected park system is predicated on completion of the 40-mile loop. And I'm very concerned about hearing about the snag that's developed on the Belrose line. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if it takes state, I don't care if we have to get the National Guard out, we need to get the Belrose line for the 40-mile loop, and I don't care how it happens. Fourth, as I've already indicated, we need more, to more fully involve the business community. My time is running out, I'll wrap this up. Um, fifth, Portland, State's, Portland State University's role in urban natural areas needs to be expanded. I've heard a lot of discussion, and I'm a uh, graduate of PSU for grad school, I've heard a lot of discussion about what role does PSU play in the, the system, the higher education system in the state of Oregon. Well, I can't think of anything more appropriate for PSU than to focus on urban issues. The urban planning, planning uh, department does a good job at that. Joe Porosky in geography has done a fantastic job of, of coordinating with Metro on this new study we're working on. Dick Forbes in biology, and uh, Jack Churchill in public policy. We need to expand that and perhaps form a, uh, an urban natural areas institute at Portland State University. Sixth, we cannot settle for protecting what we have. We need to develop a system of creation and restoration of degraded areas like the Columbia Slough, which Environmental Services is working hard on, Fano Creek, Johnson Creek, and other urban stream corridors which have been degraded. Seventh, we need to institute a regional environmental education program along the lines of the Platte River Greenway in Denver and East Bay's program in East Bay. We have a nucleus of that effort through Oxbow County, Oxbow County Park, Tryon Creek, Hoy Arboretum, and others, but we need to build on that metro-wide. Eighth, as the Craig report um, stated, natural resources need to be placed on a par with regional transportation urban growth boundary and other urban services. And I can tell you that if we're going to be looking at supersiding for freeways, as far as I'm concerned, we should be looking at supersiding for parks and natural areas. And uh, that's an issue that's looming in our very near future right now. I may get a question on that. Ninth, local jurisdictions in Portland in particular need to hire professional ecologists on planning park and transportation staffs. And I want to point out that I am incredibly impressed with people like Duncan Brown with the City of Portland and other planners who really don't have a background in ecological matters, have done a tremendous job of educating themselves and I think are, are fulfilling their obligation to meeting the public interest. However, that does not suffice or make up for having professional ecologists on staff and we should be moving in that direction. Most other jurisdictions around the country I've talked with have professional ecologists. There's no excuse for us not. Finally, we need to, to secure state and federal funding to help support innovative projects, which I think we've got going here. The Eugene Springfield area just got a quarter million bucks out of uh, uh, Congressman DeFazio. I don't think, with all, with all apologies to Steve Gordon, who's a tremendous uh, individual and very energetic, he got that money for the Eugene Springfield area. We need to be getting funds like that for, for our own projects, Metro and the refuge system. Well, what role can City Club play in this effort? Many of you will remember the pivotal role the club played in securing forest park lands in the late 40s. Without the involvement of special city club committee and the city club, 
which, were prim or which primarily came from the business community, I might add. I'd like to urge uh, Forest Park would not, crossed out the wrong part, Forest Park would not be here today in my opinion. I'd like to urge that the City Club establish a special committee or perhaps a subcommittee of your land use and transportation committee to become involved in this regional planning for natural resources. I appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas and projects with you and hope our efforts will have a lasting positive influence on the metropolitan area. If we succeed this time around, it will be because there are a lot of dedicated workers building on dreams of people like the Olmsteads, Mumford, and the crafters of the 71 Crag Report, and I would like to personally meet some of those people. I think we are indebted to their work and owe it to the city and the metropolitan region to pick up where they left off. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's a little intimidating for somebody like me who's been standing up here week after week to have a speaker not only know half of the audience, but introduce them as well. So I, <clears throat> I will remind everyone there is a microphone straight ahead of me in the center of the room. Those of you that would like to ask an oral question, I would like to ask you to, to head in that direction. Questions are reserved for City Club members. Those of you that have a written question, please hold it up. Uh, the honor of the first question goes to our board horse host today, Tony Zenker. I hope I'm not a horse. Many speakers have come before us at City Club and talked about a regional perspective for planning, not only the Port of Portland, but many other economic issues. And I see this as no different. Yet our land use zoning and planning still remains in the hands of local government. How would you change our land use laws to put land use planning in the hands of the region rather than local governments. Wow. <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I think it is essential that when it comes to natural resources, there has to be a strong local um, decision-making process because I mean that's the folks who live in those lo local communities need to be involved so that's that's critical um, regarding natural resources such as wetlands stream corridors and other natural resources that by their very nature cross political boundaries we have to move toward a regional land use process of some type and I to be quite honest, I don't know what that is. I do know that um, the city of Beaverton does not necessarily, in fact, I'm sure it doesn't, look upstream or downstream in most of its land use decisions on Fannel Creek, for example. In fact, Fannel Creek is one of the best ones I could think of. Um, you look at that, that stream quarter, which most people have written off. You talk to people about Fannel Creek and their eyes glaze over. Well, they don't know that a kid caught a 14-inch cutthroat trout, native cutthroat trout out of there a couple weeks ago. Fannel Creek is very much alive. It's been um, degraded in some areas, but it still has tremendous potential to be restored, and in its existing position, condition is important. Um, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm skirting your issue. I think there needs to be a combination of local planning efforts for natural resources with a regional perspective. And I actually am hopeful that the effort on the part of Metro will, will evolve in that direction. Obviously, you heard Bonnie Hayes. She doesn't want to be told what to do in Washington County. On the other hand, Washington County has got to look at its overall impact on other counties and on lands, on natural resources that flow through the county into other jurisdictions. So I'm not, you know, Bonnie, I don't know if you're listening or if you're out there. Um, I raised this issue to her, actually, when she spoke a few weeks ago at City Club, asking whether Metro had a role to play, and she basically said, well, just don't tell us what to do. The, 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 uh, we had a great canoe trip down the Tualatin River, by the way. Bonnie, um, Roy Rogers, and John Meek, and I think they came off the river with a different, different look, I think, a different perspective on what the Tualatin represents as a resource. Um, I think the Metro project, as it's currently constituted, is moving in the direction of doing a cooperative job of looking at natural resource management. 
And I think that's what we need. It has to be cooperative, and it cannot be mandated. It's got to be in the spirit of cooperation. If Beaverton knows that Durham is doing the same good job of managing Fano Creek, and that, you know, you always hear this, well, they're all going to, all the developers are going to go to Vancouver, you know. If we protect our resources, they're all going to move across the river. Well, you hear that every day, and what I'm saying is if on a regional basis, hi, Paul, if we hear that on, on a regional basis, we address natural resource issues, um, and everybody's operating on equal footing, then you're not going to have that specter of the entire world moving to another jurisdiction to open up shops. So. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Sorry if it didn't. I'm Ray Polani, a City Hi, Club member. Uh, how do we get the metro regional uh, natural resources park and wildlife uh, uh, group to uh, get the metro regional transportation planning to reconsider some of their decisions which are clearly uh, destructive of, of, uh, of the other part? Yeah, that's, that's, again, another great question. You're asking, those are some pretty tough ones. Um, well, They have the money. See, the others have the money. Yeah, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Bet to be moving. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind, and I know you're aware of this, is that this whole regional natural areas effort is just beginning, really. And it's going to be a while before that gets fully integrated into these other regional pictures. Um, as far as I'm concerned, basically natural resources have never even been considered when uh, transportation issues are, are being discussed. I mean, I've attended TPAC and JPAC meetings, and I don't see a whole lot of discussion about wetlands and, and natural resources, at least in the ones I've attended. Um, that has to change, obviously. And uh, the only way that's going to happen is if we get, first of all, the information from the inventories that we're working on so that we can, we can incorporate that into regional transportation issues. So getting the baseline information, I think, is one of the most critical things we need to do. And this color infrared stuff will do it, I think, for us. Thank you. I thought you were going to ask about the Bell City Rose. Club member. About 20 years ago, the Port of Portland gobbled up one of the most gorgeous wetland areas that any city had. And that I referred to the Kelly Point, Smith, Bybee area, which is also known as the Ledbetter Estate Area. Nobody, nobody, including myself, even made a whimper. What is left of that, and what are the plans for it? Well, thank you for asking that question. Actually, I've been involved in, in issues out there for some time now. You're right. We've lost many of the natural resources in that area. On the other hand, as, as with the rest of the metropolitan area, we're fortunate in still having a tremendous core of wetlands, uh, lakes, the Columbia Slough, and Kelly Point Park available to us today. And I guess. The, the point is, we need to look backward to understand what we've lost, but I think in looking forward, the Port of Portland, to their credit, and I'll tell you, I've not been hesitant at all to take them on when it was appropriate. The Port of Portland, over the last three years in particular, through Brian Campbell, um, Sebastian Deegans, and some of their other employees, and I have no idea how high this goes, at least the people I work with, um, have taken a much more sensitive view of protecting natural resources in the community. Um, they've been, they're the ones that really put together the Smith and Bobby Lakes Management Plan Committee. There have been, I don't know how many efforts to do that in the past, all of which failed. We're moving forward on that now. If you're interested in, in the resources that are available today, the brochure out in the front, North Portland Naturally, which I worked on with uh, some other Portland Audubon folks, through Metro, through the uh, North Portland Enhancement Committee, depicts the canoeing, wildlife viewing, and other opportunities um, through, through a map. So there are still some really neat areas out in North Portland, tremendous areas. Smith, Smith and Bybee Lakes both have water in them. The water levels are maybe not at what some people would like, and that's one of the major thrusts of the, water ma of the overall management plan. Uh, Smith and Bybee Lakes needs help. As I said, none of these areas have been untouched by human hands, and unfortunate, for better or worse, we're in a situation now where we have to put energy into managing those, those areas which have been um, degraded in some cases. James Lehman, City Club member. I'm glad to see we're beginning to start planning ahead, which we tend to wait too late. I was at uh, 
press conference at the King facility this morning where there were some citizens that were claiming that the mayor hadn't been planning ahead and protecting North Portland and Northeast Portland and, and culminating with the firing of Ollie Smith. But uh, my question is more on a global issue is in view of the uh, many speakers that I've been hearing even on the radio this morning about warning about the ozone hole widening and the greenhouse effect. What do you see as our responsibility on parks and uh, this planning you're talking about and how it might affect the greenhouse uh, problem uh, and our relationship, you know, to our country and our world as leaders in the Northwest? Well, you know, actually I've had a number of people over the years criticize spending a lot of time and energy working on the local level. In fact, a very close friend of mine one day said, you know, Mike, working on local issues is, uh, is like rearranging the deck chairs of the Titanic. Um, I happen to ascribe to the school of thought, those of you who read Rene Dubot, um, coined the phrase, think globally, act locally. And in my opinion, the best thing we can do is keep our own house in order, start by doing what we can on the local level and uh, try to encourage through environmental education programs and a commitment to the environment at home, we can expand that to a more, more of a world view, I guess. I think it takes a lot of gall for, for those of us who live in North America to be cutting three to five percent of remaining old growth and then going down to South America and complaining because they're cutting rainforests. Doesn't make any sense. Um, I think we need to get our, order, our, order, our own house in order, would be my response. John White, member. I'd like you to comment on the potential use of public right-of-way for wildlife habitat, particularly freeway right-of-way, uh, road right-of-way, um, all of that land out there along uh, 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 the MAX line, that sort of thing. Well, I think there's, there are tremendous opportunities um, I know that in Europe in particular, in Britain, they've done a lot to protect open spaces, wildlands along railroad corridors. And they have tremendous wildlife values. I'm a bit concerned, I know it's possible to, but I'm a bit concerned about focusing too much attention along roadways um, that might attract species that, that in the long term are probably going to be negatively impacted by a by uh, motor traffic. On the other hand, there are efforts in, in, in Texas, for example, and other states to plant native vegetation, wildflower displays along roadways, which I think we should be m doing myself. What, what, could, I, could I just finish with one more thing? Bellingham, Washington, one of the most exciting projects I've come across in the last 10 years, there's, there's a park planner in Bellingham who is researching all of the platted rights away, public rights away in the city of Bellingham, and they've scarfed all those up. The Park Bureau has a tremendous system of lin linear parks that were intended one day to be um, carriageways, and I think that's another thing we should be looking at in the metropolitan area. We may have some of those same opportunities. I'm Don Sterling, a member. The state of Oregon has a fish and wildlife department. What role can they play in the, pr the plans that you're advocating? Well, a major one. Thanks for asking that question. In fact, I have to, I should back up. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's non-game program funded my work for the first three years, and I'd like to thank them for that support. Um, beyond that, uh, they do have a non-game program. In fact, Claire Pucci, um, our departing executive director, is going to work for that program. Um, they are hiring, within the next few months, an urban biologist who will be based in the Portland metropolitan area. And that urban biologist's role, I hope, will be doing a lot toward um, pushing these concepts. Barton DeLacy, Land Use and Transportation Committee. Uh, how do you propose, or what's the best strategy to pay for much of the acquisition? Uh, that, that really is the, is the critical uh, uh, issue there. And, and I, do you have a grand strategy that maybe we could help with. <laughs> well, you're right, that is the question. And in fact, we've uh, invited up a couple times, Metro last and myself last, last spring, Dick Trudeau, who is a director of the East Bay Regional Park District for, for many years, who is a, uh, a national expert on developing those strategies. And that is one of the major roles that Metro will play, in my opinion, 
um, in that in the natural areas project. And I guess all I can say from my, I can't even balance my own checkbook. Okay, so I'm not I'm not a funding strategist other than maybe getting some uh, getting some funds periodically to do some of the projects I care about. We need to, without question, produce a regionally based funding strategy, though. Um, and there's no question in my mind the East Bay Regional Park District bond measure, $225 million passed with just shy of 70 percent of the, of the vote. People will support open space and park programs. Personally, I was disappointed to see a $7.3 million levy for Portland Parks. I thought we should have been aiming higher. I think it was a real mistake. Um, I think that the people would have supported a, a larger levy. And I think that they will in the future, and we need to, to, set, to raise our sights, I think. I realize there were a lot of political issues at work there. But. Since there uh, is no one else standing at the mic, I'll use the immense power of the presidency to ask my own question, which will be the last one for the day. Uh, <laughs> if you drive around Clackamas and Washington counties in particular, and parts of East Multnomah County, and see some of the various uh, business developments and new things that are going on there. There seems to be uh, a, a fairly wide range of open space in these different developments from uh, what looks like very little to uh, some very uh, attractive and beautiful areas that even include some areas that have apparently have been left wild. What role, if any, uh, is your study playing in trying to connect in with the business community with regard to urging them to participate in your program? Uh, and Perhaps this is a chance for you to give a pitch to the business community. Thank you. Well, actually, I almost always refer to the coal company. The coal Creekside development in Beaverton, in my opinion, although it was very contentious initially, can't gloss that over. The bottom line is that when they were through developing that center with mentor graphics sitting looking out over that marsh, that the coal company um, is not reluctant at all to point out that the um, properties that adjoin that natural area are tremendously higher value than other properties that they, that they own. And the coal company and some others see those values in natural resources. They see the value in, uh, in retaining those as a feature on their development. And I think that's another direction that open space uh, management planning in the urban area is going. And I personally am very excited about the, the, the future potential. And I think I think what we have to do is overcome the lack of uh, recognition of that fact on the part of some developers. And if you look around at uh, various cities, I think, I think they're on the move in that direction. Please join me in thanking Mike Houck for an excellent presentation. I would like to thank Karen one more time for three terrific years. Thank you. You did a terrific job. Uh, and I hope you will join us all next week upstairs in the Mayfair Room for Matthew Prophet. We are adjourned.